Great, thank you. Um, I listened, I, got, I managed to get on about halfway through Anne's presentation. I find that very interesting how numbers are coming down, the prices of cows are going down. So is there a way that we can get more producers to somehow manage to keep more cows on the farm economically and with the upside potential that you know you sort of can read between the lines there's an opportunity here if you can keep your cows and get those calves for next fall there might be a silver lining in this whole process there's two parts that we still have to worry about for next year one being are we going to have enough moisture to get the grass and forages uh, started next spring after driving around i've seen a lot of pastures that look like pool tables and they're going to take till the middle of june to really get going and the second thing is water so those come into play with looking forward even beyond the winter feeding program so with that um what i'm going to be chatting about here today is what are the changes in nutrients, uh, nutrient requirements for ca for cattle, and how do you adjust it so that you're using your feeds as economically as you possibly can, and uh, saving the best feed for when you need it? Some people in your neck of the woods, Marty, are uh, grazing canola regrowth and having great success about it. So I will talk about that as well, and it'll also apply for the other forages that are regrowing. Uh, what types of protein are available? But this year, feed test results are showing that proteins are up considerably uh, compared to average just because the plants are a lot shorter and uh, you're getting a better leaf to stem ratio. Uh, nitrates, what happens when you're using various mechanical means to deliver feed? And with hay at 10 and 12 cents a pound, it definitely becomes a big expense when you're losing feed and then using the liquid molasses products. If I could have a nickel for every time I've had a call this fall about using molasses on straw bales, I wouldn't have to do this anymore. So the principle of the first limiting nutrient is you are always looking to try to optimize the use of your nutrients so that they are the same across everything that's there. So in this example, the blue patch on the protein shows that the protein was deficient in that ration. And once they fix the protein levels, the next thing that became limiting is energy. And that's typically what happens. It's always a fight between protein and energy to get everything balanced out. The rest of it, you can do a lot easier, but depending on the quality of the forage, it, and it really makes it difficult some years to get those to go into balance. So as you're starting your calving season on the February, you can see that your energy requirements and protein requirements are almost at the peak. And the reason for that is you've got a calf that is gaining someplace between three quarters and a pound a day. The cow needs to keep tissue on her back so she's not losing weight and able to produce milk. So as the... Uh, after the start of calving, say the 1st of March, your maximum milk production occurs eight weeks after calving and maximum feed intake occurs 12 weeks after calving. So after that point, you're gonna lose between two and 3% of milk yield per month as that lactation goes on. Once the cows are weaned, her nutrient requirements drop by 25%. She'll probably be uh, three months, maybe four months pregnant by that point in time where the weaning occurs. And generally as that calf increases in size, you're gonna have an increase in the amount of energy and protein that's required. So rules of thumb that I use, mid-pregnancy, late pregnancy and after calving, we're looking at seven, nine and 11% protein and energy levels of 55, 60 and 65%. For feeder calves, this one's a little bit more difficult to estimate the amount of energy that you need. It all depends. Is, are you backgrounding calves at one and, a, one and three quarters to two pounds a day? 
versus somebody that's pushing his calves at two and a half pounds a day, the energy requirements are going to be different. So that's why I don't have anything on that slide. But to get that animal to frame out and develop properly, if you start with a thousand pound animal at 10% protein in the ration, for every 100 pounds that the weight of that calf is reduced, you increase your protein content by 1%. So if you're weaning a 600 pound calf right now, the minimum protein requirement is 14%. And it really does make a difference. If Even if you've got a calf that was on a low protein ration off right off a of weaning and then two months later you realize that it's you know it's putting on a lot of fat and it looks fleshy but it's not stretching and framing if you bring that protein levels back up it will uh get some compensatory growth where they will stretch lengthen they will frame out they'll develop a lot more muscle and not be just fat dry matter intake by calves very varies by weight you can see that the 600 pound, 650 pound calf will eat two and a half percent of body weight or rif roughly 16 pounds of dry matter per day. Um, John McKinnon did some great work on this. And you can see when you've got the smaller calves, they can't eat as much. They're not used to eating. Once they learn how to eat at that 550, five, you know, that transition from 500 to 550, you can see how much weight, it, uh, extra feed they're actually able to eat. And then as they get larger, typically what you're doing at the higher weights is you're including a lot more grain and a lot less forage. So uh, that slows down the total feed intake as well. Grazing or baling uh, crop regrowth has been a savior for a lot of people this fall, especially for areas that were extremely dry uh, very little forage, little silage, and then they got an, a, a couple inches of rain and you've got that regrowth. This is excellent feed. If your cows are a little bit thin and you can wean your calves, put them onto some of this regrowth. It's 14 to 16 percent protein, 62 to 65 percent TDN. So that makes it equivalent to a high quality first cut alfalfa grass hay. And if you wean those cows and reduce their nutrient requirements by 25%, they will gain probably two to three pounds a day on this high quality feed. Now, with every, every silver lining, there's always gotta be somebody who throws a monkey wrench in it. And the two cautions are, you can have high nitrates, especially on the canola stubble or canola regrowth where the person was, was uh, fertilizing for 80, or 60 to 80 bushels of canola and they only got 20. So there's gonna be a fair bit of nitrogen reserve in the soil and also the same with sulfur. Now, it the other side of the coin that you have to watch out for that, and we'll talk about it in a minute, is you have to add the amount of sulfur from the water in with what you're getting from the feed so that you don't run into a, a polio situation. Nitrates, the other side of the coin, Cattle have the highest uh, susceptibility to, to nitrate poisoning. Sheep, two and a half times more resistant than cattle. Horses, they're not a ruminant. They're a modified ruminant, so it's not a problem. And then pigs and chickens, they generally, you know, you don't have nitrates in grain, so it's only in the forage component. And you don't feed uh, um, any realistic quantity of forage to a pig or a chicken. So with nitrates, when you get a high nitrate level, uh, the ingested feed, nitrate is changed to nitrate and eventually to ammonia. The nitrate to ammonia is the rate limiting step. If the nitrite levels get too high, it is, con it is uh, uh, sent into the bloodstream, changes the shape of the hemoglobins where it cannot release the carbon dioxide Therefore, when it gets to the lung, it can't picks up, cannot pick up any oxygen, and eventually that animal is short of oxygen and suffocates from the inside out. Uh, death will occur when you got 70 to 80 percent met hemoglobin, and uh, there's not much you can do when it gets to that point. Uh, now, when you do get the transfer of 
uh, nitrate into the bloodstream, there will be a certain amount of ammonia along with, or excuse me, the ammonia, the second step is not a problem. That'll go to the kidney and be excreted. It's that accumulation of nitrate that gives you the problem. So subclinical poisoning, no real apparent clinical signs. A lot of the uh, papers or the results that you get from feed testing labs will say that half a percent is where you're going to have toxicity problems. I wish somebody would fix that because uh, work by Crawford back in the 60s shows that he had no problems with feeding uh, oat green feed at 1%. I've had uh, clients feed 1.2, 1.3% nitrates to a pregnant cow without causing abortions either. But the caveat in that is they were not in their last trimester. 25% of the maternal oxygen is needed to keep that calf alive in the last 90 days of pregnancy. So you got to be careful. But it can cause subclinical problems, uh, lower growth rate, lower milk production. They may not eat as much, low blood pressure, may be more susceptible to diseases. And there's been some reports that you might have some reproduction problems. But typically, uh, the one that we have to really uh, be concerned about is this acute poisoning where you take animals off of one pasture, put them into swath grazing or some of this regrowth and there's that immediate change, that shock to the system, the animal hasn't adapted itself to, to the higher nitrate levels and you can see that you're going to find animals dead on the pasture. That's usually the first symptom. Uh, heated green feeds, this year was not a problem. A lot of the forages came off really dry and we didn't have to fight with, with uh, higher moisture green feeds. But in previous years where they bailed up green feed at 18, 19, 20% and didn't put it under plastic, if there was nitrate present and the bales got beyond higher than 40 degrees Celsius, there's a chemical reaction where it will convert the nitrates to nitrite in the bale before it's actually ingested. And the nitrites are 10 times more toxic than the nitrates. So you've got to add the nitrite plus the nitrate to get your total nitrate equivalent and calculate it backwards from that. Sulfur toxicity, uh, in, in a feedlot situation, they always talk about 0.4% sulfur being the upper limit. When you get more sulfur in the diet, when the sulfur hits the rumen, combines with the water, forms sulfuric acid, it drops the pH in the rumen, the bacteria responsible or microbes responsible for producing thiamine are killed off. And without thiamine, the head or the brain swells, and that's what causes polio. And they die of just too much pressure on the brain and it cannot function. So, uh, in a high forage ration like the canola uh, regrowth, you can go as high as 0.55%, but that's I'm getting jittery at that point. That's that's getting to where I I have I have some personal concerns with that. Now the other side of the coin that we're facing right now, I was driving around for the last couple of weeks. A lot of the dugouts are down to about 20 or 25 percent of capacity with uh, sloughs being completely dry. Water quality is a real concern right now. Um, in 2017, there was a grazing reserve in northwestern Saskatchewan that moved cows from one paddock to another. Uh, it was a hot, it was a dry summer. And five days later, when they came back and checked the cows, there were 200 dead. And the, after doing a bunch of water sampling and looking at the analysis, they found that the sulfate levels were really, really high, along with total dissolved solids, electrical conductivity, and high mineral content. Uh, when they did a study uh, looking at, a, at 2,000 different wells or 2,000 different dugouts, they found that half of them that summer had sulfur levels that were extremely high and not suitable for use. And the reason I'm bringing this up for now is if we don't get a lot of runoff, if 
you know, snow or rain or runoff, however you want to fill those dugouts, water quality is going to be poor next year. And that could limit your access to some of the forage acres because there's no water available unless you start hauling. So just something to consider. Um, the designation by the water quality people state that 200 parts per million or 2,000 milligrams or 2,000 milligrams per liter uh, is where you get the toxicity starting to show up. You 0.4% sulfur, if we're using that as our standard, you can see that at 25 degrees and 63 liters of consumption, the 2000 PPM is not a concern. But we've had temperatures in the mid 30s to high 30s this year, some up to the 40s. Your water consumption will actually double from 25 to 35 degrees. In that case, it's the total sulfur consumption that you have to be concerned about. So in that case, at 34 degrees and 112 liters of consumption, 1,000 parts per million sulfur will be enough to cause the problem. So it's a moving target depending on temperatures, water consumption, and water quality. So to help offset this, I'm going to just quickly throw this out there because I believe there's still money available through the Canadian Ag Priorities program where you can get assistance with uh, putting in different uh, water systems and water lines and pipelines and that kind of stuff. But changing cows from drinking out of a dugout into a wet well or a trough system or even a nose pump if they, if they figure out how to use it, in 30 days uh, around the Lethbridge area, cows, instead of maintaining their body weight, they gained 15 pounds. Over that same period of time, those calves gained another 20 pounds. And the reason for that is the lower quality of water with the higher total dissolved solids, they drink less water. When they drink less water, they can't eat as much feed. If they can't produce or if they can't consume as much feed, they're not going to either produce more milk or more weight gain on the cow. And therefore, you can see the response by from this trial from Lethbridge. Steers on another trial, uh, but related to this one conducted by Dr. Wilms, steer, 700 weight steers uh, gained roughly an extra half a pound a day by drinking out of a wet well or a, a pump system rather than walking into the dugouts. So more efficient use of the forage resources that you have. Right now, it's not... Uh, a huge problem for cows that are in mid-pregnancy with only a 7% uh, protein requirement. But as we get into the lactation period with 11%, if you're using a straw grain ration, for example, you're going to need some additional source of protein. And the ones that are available right now, uh, peas, lentils, corn, or wheat distillers, I know they're expensive, but you've got a lot of protein, peas and lentils. Uh, I've heard this morning that peas, uh, pea screenings are running from $8.50 to $9 a bushel. It's providing 24% protein. Energy content is as good as corn for the peas. Lentils, same protein content and energy content equivalent to barley. The big thing with, uh, with the straight grains, it's no different than barley or oats. You're going to have low calcium levels, higher phosphorus levels. So it's not a big deal. But when you get to the corn and wheat distillers at 30 or 39 percent protein, so you're going to be feeding about 40 percent less. Energy content's only as good as oats. That's no problem. If you're looking for the protein, that's what you're after. But the other side of the coin is Phosphorus levels can be two to three times higher than what you find in grains. And the same with the magnesium, usually about double to three times as much. In this case, if you're feeding a one-to-one -one mineral or a two-to-one mineral, it's not going to work. You're going to need something that's more along the lines of 18 to 20 percent calcium, only three or four percent protein, so a four-to-one or a five-to-one ratio. A feedlot mineral would work very well. Or in some cases, depending on how much grain you're feeding, you might only need to feed four 
four and a half ounces of limestone per head per day to a pregnant cow or a lactating cow to bring things into line. Urea, another great source of protein. It's a 4600 fertilizer that's been scrubbed to remove any uh, heavy metals that have, may have been present during the, uh, during the manufacturing process. You can feed it to calves over 450 pounds. The rumen is, is sufficiently uh, developed so that it, it can utilize that. But uh, the big thing is anytime you add non-protein nitrogen, you need to feed probably three to four pounds of grain so that there's soluble carbohydrates available to utilize that available nitrogen. Now, urea is a uh, totally degradable protein uh, or degradable nitrogen source, so it's used to feed the bugs, bugs but it is not a bypass protein. So if you're looking at uh, increasing the fat content in your milk or in influencing uh, growth rate on the animals, you need to have that degradable or undegradable protein source available as well. And that's higher when you use the byproducts, the corn and wheat distillers. Maximum increase in protein in the final ration is 25% of the total. So if you're at eight, you can probably go to 10, maybe 10 and a half percent protein with the urea. Other than that, you're going to need to find some other source uh, to supplement the protein. Straw grain rations for pregnant cows. Uh, a 1,400 pound cow at five months of pregnancy or, or even in late pregnancy, they can do very well on a straight straw grain ration. You don't have to feed hay to these animals because if you're feeding, you know, for example, on the five month pregnancy cow, seven pounds of barley, uh, 12 pounds of pea straw, uh, splitting your straw between either all barley straw or splitting it half and half between pea straw and barley straw, you can see that that is adequate to meet the nutrient requirements of that animal. The big difference is Pea straw has a lot of calcium. It's a legume, no different than an alfalfa. So you could have one to one and a quarter percent calcium in the pea straw. So that reduces the amount of limestone or calcium that you have to supplement. So with half pea straw, half barley straw, a two to one mineral is probably good enough. Uh, half a pound of 32% supplement because your pea straw is also two to two and a half pounds or percent higher in protein than barley straw. So the difference between the two, you need the same amount of grain. With the barley straw, you need that high calcium mineral, that six, uh, 16, 18, 20% calcium. Whereas with the pea straw there, you know, it could get away with a two to one mineral. But anytime you're putting rations together, have the feed testing done. Figure out what's there do your trace minerals. And the one thing that I've found really interesting is I've been doing a fair bit of sampling out in the gray wooded soil zone. And usually we think that molybdenum is only a problem in Manitoba and Eastern Saskatchewan. I'm finding levels that are high enough to cause a uh, tie up of copper in, in the gray wooded soil zone. So if you're getting a feed test done, Add the extra, uh, add molybdenum to the reason to the request, and that'll affect the type of, of uh, manufacture or the the formulation of the mineral that you're going to need. Now, at eight months pregnant, uh, you're going to need eight pounds of barley grain for when you're feeding the pea straw, or if you're feeding. Uh, uh, half barley and half pea grain, you can see that half pea straw, half barley straw, you really don't need the protein supplementation because you're getting that 24% protein from the peas. Without any peas in the ration, you're going to need roughly two to two and a half pounds of 32% supplement. Canola meal, uh, any of the byproducts is something that you can pick up, is an option to use in these type of rations. But 
you don't need to feed hay prior to calving if you're short of feed. And I'm going back to what Ann said is if if the number of cows go down, we're, 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 we don't have a crystal ball to see where those calf prices are next next September, but it's a lot easier to maintain a cow in good condition, keep your own cows over winter instead of going back out and buying somebody else's uh, cows from the auction market because you've established your string and it's the one that you want to keep. Light bushel weight grains. Gary Matheson did some work at the University of Alberta back in 92 and he compared 37 versus 54 pound barley. And he found that there was no difference in average daily gain or feed conversion as long as the barley was above 42 pounds. Below 42 pounds, you lose 1% efficiency for every pound drop in bushel weight. So that 37 pound barley was 5% less efficient than 42 pound barley. And the reason I'm mentioning that is I don't know if the feed mills or the feedlots are taking anything under 46 pounds right now. Uh, if you can find somebody that has a good supply or a supply of lightweight barley that'll meet your needs, purchase it. There's probably going to be some sort of price discount on it because there's less demand for that barley. Readjust your rolls so that you are getting that barley broken into two pieces. That's still important no matter what the bushel weight is. Otherwise, you're going to have 12 to 15% reduction in digestive efficiency. But once you get that roller set properly and uh, you're working with that lighter weight barley, just you know, adjust your feeding rates according to the reduction in efficiency. So when, when you're looking at building a ration, feed testing is critical. You have to know what's going into there before you try to develop a blended ration. Use your lower quality feeds early in the winter or in the earlier stages of pregnancy, keep the better ones for after calving. Cow condition dramatically influences the amount of feed and the quality of feed that you require to keep those cows through winter. I've just by the driving along some country roads, slowing down and looking at cows on pasture, some of them are probably 150 to 200 pounds light. You can see that they're not carrying as much flesh as they need. And if the cows are 200 pounds light, they're going to need an additional 1,400 pounds of hay just to stay warm over the winter, not to gain weight, just to stay warm. And you know, a thin cow going into winter, she doesn't produce as much milk. She doesn't have the quality of colostrum. Her chances of getting rebred are lower because she is in thin condition. So it's not just, you know, looking at the cows right now and seeing, well, they'll make it through the winter. There's long-term implications for these thin cows. If you uh, use cow bites, great. It's one tool. But the big thing is, uh, if you're not sure what you need to do, get a consultant or get a feed feed mill nutritionist or if anybody's from BC or Saskatchewan listening to this, they've still got extension people that, can help, that can help them build rations as well. So processing grain, I mentioned that you've got that 12 to 15 percent reduction in efficiency when you're feeding barley. It's 25 percent reduction efficiency for wheat and only six or seven percent for oats. But if you overprocess the grain, it's very rapidly digested. It can cause acidosis. It can cause grain overload. It can cause bloat. So when you have animals over 700 pounds, you need to process the grain. Younger than that or smaller than that, they take their time, they chew, and they do very, very well. They break the kernels by chewing before they swallow. But over 700 pounds, it needs to be processed. Grains should be someplace between 70 and 75% of original bushel weight. So if you have 48 pound barley going into a roller or into a hammer mill, when it comes back out and you recheck the bushel weight, it should be in that 36 pound range for that barley. Um, the other side of the coin, if you wanna reduce the incidence of bloat or acidosis, you should have less than 5% fines by weight 
that go over a one millimeter screen. So it takes a little bit of, of care to get the proper processing. If you're finding that it is too fine coming out of a hammer mill, three things can be done. Put in old hammers, put in an old screen, or slow the tractor down by five, 600 RPM. Yes, it'll take a little bit longer to mill that load of feed, but you'll reduce the amount of fines and the amount of cracking that you get on that grain. This one, this is one year where processing definitely pays a big dividend for, for the work that you have to do. The other study that Matheson did at the University of Alberta back in 2002, he's done a lot more than this, but these are the two that are really relevant for what we're talking about today, is they took took a bunch of uh, pregnant cows, mid and late pregnancy. They fed them only half a percent of body weight in forage. So instead of 30 pounds of hay, they were feeding someplace in that 10 pound range. So they were saving two thirds of their hay bill uh, or the hay supply for later in the year. And they made up the energy and protein differential by adding extra barley and extra protein. <laughs> so what they found was uh, half, a, half a percent at the Ellerslie test station where they were looking at the animals two, three, four times a day. They monitored body condition score. They weighed them every two weeks. They got good results. But when you're in a more extensive situation, they recommend that you keep it at 1% of forage. Uh, of um, original or uh, of of uh, body weight, so for fifteen hundred pound cow would get fifteen pounds of hay instead of thirty two or thirty four. They made up the difference with the grain and the minerals and the supplementation program. They had absolutely no problems at all with calving. The cows maintained condition. They produced milk. When breeding season came along, you couldn't tell the difference between the cows that were on one percent or half a percent forage and those that were on full hay. The big thing was they maintained body condition. So those animals were not losing weight. So if you're wanting to do this, use that 1% of body weight as forage intake. You won't have to sell as many cows off. If you've got the grain supply and the extra protein supplements available, uh, yes, it's gonna be expensive to feed them that way, but maybe you don't have to sell on, you know, 40 or 50 cows or 100 cows and you can keep them in the herd to have the cows for next spring. So 1,400 pound cow in mid-pregnancy, 14 pounds of straw, 11 pounds of grain and a pound of 32% supplement. If you were using a, a grass hay, an average grass hay, same amount, 14 pounds, but your barley went down to eight. Late pregnancy, can see that that additional energy requirement uh, in that last trimester, they had to feed a little bit more grain, same amount of 32% supplement. And if you were looking at a grass hay, your barley went up to 10.5 pounds a day. So it's, it's a consider, it's something to consider that you can get away with 26 pounds of total feed intake instead of 35. And instead of 32 pounds of hay, you can go down to 14. Commercial pellets. A lot of people are turning these, turning, turning to this uh, product right now, and it is a good option. Uh, but price is not the final determining factor of what product to use. Uh, it the price is partly due to demand and partly due to the ingredients that are in that material. So how much, if you're talking to somebody and wanting to buy the pellets, ask the questions, how much whole grain is in there? How much oats, how much barley, how much wheat? The reason I mentioned wheat is wheat is very rapidly digested in the rumen. And when it comes out of a pellet, it is ground very, very fine. So it's, it's immediately available in the rumen once the pellet is uh, broken up by the digestion and that produces a lot of acid. So if there's a high, high amount of wheat in the pellet, 
again, you're looking at that possibility of having uh, acidosis or or bloat. How much of the product is screenings? You know, you never know what's in there. Your wheat mids, wheat shorts, broken kernels. Uh, you can have canola screenings or other grain screenings. You can have forage screenings, uh, which all influences the total amount of fiber that's in that pellet. And that can reduce or does reduce the amount of energy. So a lot of these pellets only have us the same amount of energy or a little bit more energy than what you'd have in an average quality hay. Uh, the biggest thing that can happen as, as being seriously detrimental right off the start is if they're taking in screenings with a lot of ergot in it, you will not see the ergot in the pellets because it's been ground so fine. But what you will see is four or five days after introducing a new grain pellet, you have, if there is a high ergot content, the feed intake will drop by 30, 40%. It'll appear as if the animals have some sort of a respiratory disease and you know you might treat them with some sort of antibiotic to get them back up and then four or five days after you treat them they come back they're eating well and then four or five days after that they go down again so if you see that feed intake with a bunch of pellets that have just arrived on a load Call a feed mill, call your feed representative, have them take a sample, send it to Prairie Diagnostic Services in Saskatoon, and have them test for ergot. Changing gears here a little bit, salt and mineral supplementation. 25 uh, cows in the middle of winter will consume 25% more salt and mineral if it's in the loose form versus the block. For a pregnant cow, 75% of her uh, salt mineral consumption occurs at night. So if you're not getting the consumption that you need, one option is to put a second salt station up where the loafing area is and see if that helps. If not, throw in five pounds of dried molasses per bag of product, and that may increase your intake as well. Uh, rough rules of thumb 100 cows should consume a bag of salt per week and that's a 55 pound bag 250 cows should consume a bag of mineral per day and that again is a 55 pound bag if if you have the ability to if you need to mix salt and mineral together don't put them out in separate feeders cows have a craving for salt but they do not have a craving for minerals. So they don't know how to differentiate between the two, mix them together, give them one option, and that way you know they're getting both. And if, if possible, try to put it into a TMR or into a grain mix because putting it out free choice, cows only go after salt and mineral once every 4.85 days. Calves a little bit better, but the variability intake uh, is what's really concerning. A cow can be, eat any place from one gram to 774 grams or 1.6 pounds of mineral and salt at one feeding. And that doesn't do anybody any good uh, as far as the pocketbook goes. And yes, you may say that, well, in, in a week's time, 100 cows have gone through a bag of salt, but how many of those actually went and ate and how many had nothing? So force feeding it in a TMR or in a grain mix is probably the better way to go. Bale processor, very convenient, very helpful to get the feed out in a short period of time. But the concern with that is uh, a bale processor feeding on snow, 19% loss, physical waste. A bale unroller had 12.3. The 75% of the feed that is lost is less than three quarters of an inch in diameter. That is the leaves, that is the, the flowers, the high quality portions of the plant. So you may have 19% physical loss, but you're looking at 25, 26% of protein and calcium is lost as well. That's always, you know, the highest quality portion of that feed is gone. 
With the bail unroller, you don't have as much physical loss, but when they walked across the windrow of the bale, they're breaking off the leaves, they're breaking off the, the flowers, and you're still getting that higher protein loss and calcium loss. So it's an expensive way to feed right now. Uh, chopped silage, 26% waste. And when that experiment was done, the operator of the feed wagon shorted the animals by about 30% of what they should have got. So my suspicion is uh, I would expect that silage losses to be in that 30 to 35% range. And talking to fellows who did build bunks and put their silage in the bunk, that was the kind of number that they were giving me as feedback as well. Now the, the little bunks with the, with the heifers on it, that was the ex experimental uh, size feeder we had in Lacombe when we did the trial. But on a commercial scale, you can see the picture of the bunk on the left-hand side. It's roughly 28 feet long, a, a length of drill stem, five feet wide, and about 30, about 30 inches tall. The height depends on the size of your cow and what you have for a discharge on the bale processor. And the other thing that I would suggest to prevent the cows from getting into that feeder is to make it look like a soup bowl. So your bottom rail is probably 12 to 20 inches narrower than the top, because if the cow can't go ahead and set her first foot on the ground inside the feeder and support her weight, there's no way she can put her second foot in there and get into the bunk. So there are ways to keep animals out of those feeders. One feeder like that with a 1400 pound bale of hay will feed about 40 cows. Liquid molasses on straw bales. It is something that shows up when feed supplies are tight. It is a product that I have some concerns with, and we'll get into that, but what I hear from fellows that use it, well, I, I fed extra molasses, the cows are, are gonna be okay. I, I, I did my due diligence, but the problem is a lot of times they wanna do something, they wanna help their cows, but they don't realize that this is a partial solution to the situation. Um, typically what they're putting is any place from 70 to 100 pounds of product per thousand pound bale. The cost is roughly 25 to 27 cents a pound. I haven't updated the cost. So if you've got a 1400 pound cow, she'll eat one and a half percent of her body weight in straw as a maximum. So that thousand pound bale will feed 50 cows. So depending on application rate, you're gonna get between one and a half and two pounds of molasses intake by these cows every day. Now, straw intake is limited by the low protein content. It takes longer for it to be digested because the bacteria numbers are down or microbial numbers are down. And that's also influenced by the total protein in the ration. So I picked a label out of my binder that I have on hand. Uh, you can see the 32% protein is there, very little calcium or no calcium at all, very little phosphorus. And the reason for that is in order to get a registration, you have to have the same, you have to have the same quality uh, going into the tub or into the uh, mix as at the front and as at the end. Some trace mineral supplementation, vitamins are reasonable cost 25 cents a pound or higher. Yes, it does increase the protein content. Very little increase in energy. Basically that two pounds of molasses is equivalent to feeding about three quarters of a pound of barley. So barley right now is about 16 cents a pound. That two pounds of molasses is 65 to 60 to 65 cents roughly. No difference in calcium, virtually nothing for mag phosphorus and magnesium. So what you have to do along with that is you're still going to need a bunch of barley going into that ration. You're going to need limestone, magnesium, and vitamin E. Just supplementing with a one-to-one -one or a two-to-one mineral 
will not get the calcium and magnesium levels high enough to meet animals' requirements. So it's a partial answer, but you've got to do a little bit more than just feeding straw uh, laced with molasses. So in conclusion, cows can eat various forages to meet their fiber requirements. It'll keep the rumen healthy. It'll keep them functioning properly. It doesn't have to be hay or cereal silage during mid or late pregnancy. Feed test, watch the body condition of the cows. I read something this morning, they're talking about a colder winter. I don't know if it's gonna happen or not. My crystal ball's in the shop getting fixed. They just can't get repairs. So I don't know what it's gonna be. Save the high quality feeds for after calving or for the small calves you're feeding or, or feeding the uh, younger calves that you're keeping back for replacements or backgrounding. And of course, provide a balanced ration to the bulls as well. The last thing you want is a bull that's thin going out next spring. So chatting a lot about how to get things around and why it's important. This is out of the NRC. When you have a status, and this is for trace minerals, and you can apply this to any other nutrient as well. When you have a deficiency, the first thing that you're gonna lose is immunity and enzymatic function. So you're gonna have less metabolic efficiency. Those cows are gonna not do as well on that feed when there's a deficiency. Reproduction is the next thing to go when you have a deficiency. And the gray bar across the middle is where the NRC says that's where you need to be. That's why I don't use their levels. I always go higher than what's recommended by then. And by the time you're down there, you're gonna be at a situation where you're gonna start seeing the clinical problems, reproduce, reproduction problems. Uh, I'll leave that one up to the vet to talk about more likely, but it takes time to get down to the bottom, but it also takes a long time to get back out of that hole. So try to keep them in good shape and prevent the problems. Are there any questions, Marty? Let me, let me just check my crystal ball here on the chat room. I don't see anything popping up in the chat room there, there Barry yet. Um, but yeah, thanks for that. It was interesting. I'm just curious if your crystal ball repair uh, is due to the supply chain issues that we're seeing with uh, so many other things. Maybe perhaps it's on that boat that's off the coast of BC right now. Yeah, it's a microchip that they can't get. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's right. Is it the same one that uh, the trucks are using that, that caused for the big pileups of, of trucks down in, in the States, I wonder? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, no, excellent information. It seems like every time we have a nutritionist or anything on there, I mean, feed testing comes up every time right that it's important to know what you're putting into that animal so uh you know feed test feed test feed test um as well as you know one of the things i picked up too is an animal that's light going into the winter you know is not going to be or maybe requires more feed than one that goes in with a little better body condition scoring so it might be better to to bring them into the winter uh, better body condition score than to try and play catch up throughout the winter. Uh, oh, absolutely. And the easiest way to do that right now is if you haven't weaned your cows or you haven't weaned the calves uh, and those cows are a little bit thin, feed the calves in a pen or if you have to sell them, you have to sell them. But it's well worth the uh, time and effort to get those cows, you know, weaned cows back into shape before winter hits. Perfect. No, oh, that sounds great, Barry. Um, it's good that you got your your uh, screen still showing. Um, uh, you also do some of the ration balancing. If somebody goes and gets a bunch of of their feed tested and they need some help with uh, ration balancing, you are still doing that. Is that correct, Barry? That is correct. It's it's no longer with the Department of Agriculture, so there yeah. is a there is a charge because uh, I am doing this as my business now 
Yep, absolutely. And then, of course, you have a website on the bottom there, that beefconsultant.com, and I know that you've got a number of articles in that uh, website as well. So check back frequently to that to see all the things that you've updated. You bet. Perfect. Excellent. Thank you so much, Barry. I haven't seen anything coming in in the chat.